for you And dance like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom There is freedom And where the Spirit Freedom in this house. 
changes everything Come on, say it. I am free No more fear Come on Nothing can stop my praise freedom in the house today amen church who is happy to be here today mercy church my name is jonathan i have the pleasure of serving here um, as co-lead for our media team shout out to our media team out there if you're ever on the road if you're ever not in town and you log in it's because there is an awesome group of volunteers that are serving week in and week out to spread that good news amen so who was here for revival? Anybody? Let me see your hands. Oh my goodness, guys. The things that we saw that we experienced during revival, I was just floored. The, probably the biggest thing for me was the flat feet people getting arches in their feet. I was like, okay, Lord. Even my son was like, Dad, what is that about? And I was talking to somebody and I was like, you know, you never really think about flat feet if you don't have it because you run around and, you know, unless you're, you know, you can't, but you run around and you're doing it. And, and that was the biggest thing they were saying, you know, I was afraid to run. If you were here at any of the nights, there was running going on. There was things going on and, and they wanted to run. The sister wanted to run and she ran. She felt that arch and you know, there's, there's so many testimonies that, you know, God was just healing people. He was touching kidneys. He was, you know, restoring people at there. I mean, these altars, the, the, the stage, um, Pastor Vasquez, you know, shared how there was, this stage was full. If you were here on any of the nights, the stage was packed. And he said, and the stage didn't fall down. So we are ready. We are ready for revival. Amen. And there has been revival going on in this place. 
There's been revival going on here for quite some time, but I think just Friday and Saturday night, I know my son invited two friends. They came, I don't know if they'd ever been to a Pentecostal revival, but they saw it all. And the best part of it is that they gave their life to the Lord. They said yes. So we're excited, church, we're excited. If you are looking to join us in ministry to partner with us, we invite you after service, not right now, after service, see us in the front lobby, get connected because church, there was some words that were spoken, accelerate, accelerate, increase, expansion, and it's happening. So we need you to partner with us. If you're feeling that, if you're ready, join us. Because if you feel like, you know what, there's enough cameraman or there's enough people singing, I can guarantee you, we can always use you. Amen. This morning, I get to pray over our tithes and offerings. And as I was thinking about what I was going to say, it's good to have wives. Amen, men. It's good to have wives and wives that love God. And this is hard for me. Being up here is super hard. That's why I'm on the camera. That's why I'm back there doing lights because I don't like to be here on the stage. (laughs) But I'm back there and I was like, I was like, how do you, how do you do it to be up? That's my wife, Jill, right there, by the way. I said, how do you do it? She says, it's, it's just the joy. It's the joy in my heart. It's the joy that the Lord has given me. And I said, I got that joy too. I can do that too. But you know what? We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And, you know, God was showing me that when, it co- that when it came to my tithes and offerings, there was times in my life where I put more emphasis and more, uh, more trust in those bills. I would pay out all my bills and everything, and, and, I, and I would say, Lord, if I have enough after the bills, then, then I'll, I'm going to give my tithes. And you know what? I always came out short. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. I always came out short, and I was like banging my head. But you know what? We serve a loving God. There was a song I was listening to yesterday. It's, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Maybe I'm dating myself. It's an older song, but it, it just spoke to me. This, you know, so today, if, you're, if you've been struggling, if you've been wanting to take that step, because it's trust. It takes trust with our finances, amen? Because we have our budgets and we know what we can spend and we, and, you know, and we know we have you know, the, the things coming up and sometimes there's things that we can't plan for you know, the car breaking down or something going on, but God's asking us to trust him. Amen. So today, as you prepare your tithes and offerings, if this is the Lord speaking to you, take that leap of faith, trust the Lord with every part of you, including your finances. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for speaking to to us or for speaking to me, Lord, during these nights, Lord, for just doing a work in me, Lord, and doing a work in this church, Father. I thank you, Lord, that this place, Lord, that we call home, Lord, Mercy Church, Father, is a place of refuge, God. It's a place of restoration, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that as these tithes and these offerings are given here today, Lord, Father, the work, your work, Lord, is even further, Lord. But, Father, those seeds, Father, that we're planting, Lord, we're not only planting, Lord, for others, we're planting those for our own family, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, for the the tithes and the offerings, Lord, the people that are here, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your move in this place, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Mercy Church. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, even today, Lord. Even today, even now, God, you're still working, Lord. You're still moving, amen. The weapon may be full, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never. Come on, say that over your situation today. Oh my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. Come on, lift it up, church. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Sing it again. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, the victory belongs to Jesus. 
Come on, how many know that there's power? There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. Every war he wages, he will win. Come on, we can declare this. I'm not backing down. I'm not backing down from any giant. Because I know, yes, I know. I know how this story is. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Say that one more time. See, I'm gonna see you. I'm gonna see your victory. For the battle 
belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Just right there where you are, can you lift your hands and begin to thank him for the victory? Just right there in your own words, can you begin to just say, Lord, thank you for the victories that you've already given me. And thank you for the victories that are on their way, God. Thank you, Father, for the victories that I've experienced in the past. Lord, I also thank you for the victories that I'm yet to experience in the future, God. Because the same God who worked in days of old is the same God who works today. And you will be the same God tomorrow. So, Lord, your power that was working miracles in the past is the same power that is working miracles today. The same God that was winning victories in the past is the same God that is winning victories today. Come on, church. Lift your hands. Lift your voice and begin to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for my victory. Thank you that I will see your glory. Thank you that I will see your power. Thank you that I will see miracles in my life. Thank you, Lord. If you've done it before, you're going to do it again, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We honor you. We worship you, Lord. You know, over the last couple of days, many of us were able to be here in our, in our nights of revival, revival nights. Let me tell you something, it started, it started Friday and it was glorious, powerful, but then what happened last night was un, unlike anything else I think so many people have ever experienced before. We literally saw God do creative miracles, creating things on people's bodies that weren't there before. Creative miracles. The power of God was so thick and so rich in this place. God was speaking so powerfully, so divinely to the point. And I'm just recapping because I know that there, there are some that were not able to be with us. But God was speaking in a way that giving personal details of people's lives not anything shameful or anything like that. Don't, don't mistake that. No, nothing like that. But personal details of people's lives that there's no other way that an individual could have known that other than God was revealing it to them and what we experienced was so powerful that I woke up this morning and I was sharing it with, with the service right before you guys came that I was just kind of a little hung over this morning maybe I need to clarify for some of y'all what I mean by that is that over the last Friday and Saturday, the last two days, we were just drinking from the fountain of God's presence and the fountain of God's glory. God has already been speaking. Some of you may not realize this, but let me just tell you that since the month of January here at Mercy Church, in the month of January, we have grown by close to 400 people every week since the month of January evidence that God is moving, that God is stirring, and that God is working in our lives. And this morning as I woke up, my prayer was, God, don't let this die. Don't let this fire fizzle out. As a matter of fact, I don't even want it to just remain the same. I want it to keep growing, and I want it to keep spreading, and I want it to keep increasing in our lives. And there was a song that just came to my heart, and this morning I started to, to, to just sing it as a prayer. And I want to invite you to join with me. It goes like this, set a fire. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want, come on, if you, if you mean this, would you raise your hands and sing it? Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you. 
song sing there's no place i'd rather be 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 than here in your love here in your love no place i'd rather be no place there's no place i'd rather be there's no place i'd rather than here in your love here in your love come on one more time set a fire and set a fire down in my soul that i can't contain that i can't control i want more of you god i want more of you god set a fire down in my soul that i can't contain that i can't control i want more of you god come on there's no place i'd rather be can you sing it out there's no place i'd rather be there's no place i'd rather be no place there's no place i'd rather than here in your love here in your love here in your love there's no place i'd rather be there's no place i'd rather be there's no place i'd rather be and here in your love come on one more time as a prayer set a fire set a fire down in my soul that i can't contain that i can't control i want more of you god i want more can you sing it as a prayer today set a fire down in my soul that i can't contain that i can't control i want more of you god come on as a prayer one last time set a fire set a fire down in my soul I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Come on, if it's your prayer, will you bless him? Will you honor him? Will you praise him and worship him today? Yes, Lord. Lord, that's our prayer today, God. We want more of you. Lord, help us not to let this fire that you've ignited in our hearts die out, God. But I pray that in each and every one of our lives, each and every one of our hearts, we would take the encounters that we have been having with you, God. And Lord, I pray that the fire would not die down, but that it would grow and it would increase and it would spread, Father. Because you want what has started in our lives and you want what has started in Mercy Church to spread into the streets of our community, to spread to the streets of San Antonio, God. You want what has been taking place in our lives and in this church to impact, Father, the nations of this world. So, Father, we pray today, set a fire in our hearts that it would not be able to be contained or controlled, but Lord, that it would grow and that it would spread for your glory and the honor of your name. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. And the church says, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Would you, you may be seated this, this morning, and I want to just share with you what the Lord has placed in my heart for today. As, as we've been sharing with you, I mean, we, we've just literally have had encounters with God over the last couple of days. But I want you to know, and I want you to understand this, that even if you were not here in our revival nights, you have been having encounters with God. God is moving in your life. God has been speaking to your life. And the evidence of it is this, that you're here today. You would not be here today if it wasn't for the work of God in your life. You would not be here today among us worshiping God and being in this environment if God was not working in your life, orchestrating the events of your life, maneuvering the decisions of your life to bring you to this place. You being here is evidence enough for me to know that God is at work in your life. But, but I want you to understand what we're praying today, what we're, what we're believing God for today. 
that what God has been doing in our life would not be something that dies out, would not just be... As those of you that are parents, okay, maybe you've got a little bit more, more years. I'm not saying you're old. I'm just saying you got more years on the earth. You'll understand that throughout the course of time, there are certain fads. There are certain phases. Like, for instance, there was a time when I used to wear these jeans that used to be called Z Cavarici. And those of you that are like, I've never heard of that before. Yes, we're old. You can't find them today, I don't think. But it was a fad back in the day. There was another, there was another brand of jeans. They were called Jerbo jeans. Right? And those of you that are like, what the heck is he talking about? Here's what I'm getting at. You don't know about it today because it was a fad. But when it comes to the things of God, we cannot afford to just let the things that God does in our lives be a fad. Be something that's here today but fades away tomorrow. See, the reason why it's called a fad is because it fades. And the move of God was never intended in our lives to be something that we experience in one season but then fades away by the next season. That's not what God desires. He's doing something in your life. He's doing something in your heart. But his intention is that it would continue to grow and that it would continue to increase. How many of you in here today would say, I want what God's doing in my life to grow and to increase and to spread to other people? <laughs> Amen. So, so a couple of weeks back and several days ago more specifically, God began to give me the word for today because God had already shown me what was going to happen during our revival nights. God had already shared with me what was going to be taking place and the power of God that we, were going to be, that we were going to be witnessing and experiencing. And not only that, church, but what we have been experiencing in our lives as of recent, God moving and God working. And what the Lord instructed me to do for today was to bring you to a couple of places in the scriptures of other individuals in the Bible who had real and powerful encounters with God. But to look at what they did after the encounters so that you and I could know and understand what to expect after we have an encounter with God and what we need to do after we have an encounter with God. So for that, I want you to go with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 3. I want us to consider this, this first encounter that we're going to read about. This is the encounter that Moses has with God as God begins to speak to him and deal with his life through a burning bush. God begins to speak to Moses from within a bush that was burning. Let's read it together. Exodus chapter 3, beginning with verse number 1. And this is Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his suegro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw, listen to what he saw. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Now if you, I, I want you to catch, capture that detail and understand that detail. Because when God begins to reveal himself to Moses, and God wants to have an encounter with Moses, God allowed Moses to see something and to experience something that was different. I will even say that was a little strange because the Bible, if we keep reading, you'll see it in a moment. It, it, Moses actually says, I'm going to go towards that to see what this strange thing is. And you might wonder, why in the world would God cause a bush to burn, but it was not burned up? Why would God set a bush on fire, but the bush was not destroyed by that fire? The bush was not consumed or burnt up by that fire like normally it would be. Why was it a strange sight? Why was God allowing Moses to see something different, something maybe perhaps a little strange, while he was having an encounter with Moses in church? Here's the only reason why. Because Moses needed to understand that the moment that he was in was a supernatural moment. 
It wasn't an ordinary moment. You see, when we have encounters with God, those are supernatural moments. They're not ordinary moments. And sometimes God will cause us to see things and experience things that are a little bit different, that are a little bit perhaps strange to us, but God allows us to see it and to experience it so that we will understand we're in a divine moment from God. This is why, look, over the last couple of days, this is why we saw God creating arches in people's feet when they didn't have arches before. This is why God allowed us to see that. Why is it? Because they were going to die from flat feet? No. It's because God wanted us to know, I'm giving you a sign. I'm giving you an evidence that I see you, that I know you, that I'm in your midst and I'm working among you. You're in a divine moment right now. This is why God allowed us to experience a man who didn't know any of us, but he would come and, and, and as God would reveal it to him, he would speak things that were personal about people's lives, talking to them about th their homes, what was in their homes, their street addresses. He didn't know these people, but why would God cause us to see something like that? Because God wants us to understand that we're in a divine moment, that we're in a season of encounter with God. And it might seem a little strange to some, but to me it says, God, you're among us and you're working in our midst. You're among us. And so God allows Moses to see something that's a little strange. Moses observes this bush that was on fire, but it did not burn up. Look at verse number three. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that, that Moses had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And I love that, y'all, because listen to me. You and I need to understand that God knows us by name. You know, that's another thing that we saw over the last couple of days. A man who does not know anyone in this church, and yet he would call them by name as God revealed. And, and, and my wife and I were sitting right, right over here, and we were looking at ourselves like, I didn't know that that was the, their, their middle name. And he was calling them by their middle name. Again, it's just God showing us that he knows us and he's with us. God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Verse 5, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of the slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Verse 8, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey and pan dulce. By the way, give me your favorite pan dulce at the count of three. One, two, three. I like that one too. <laughs> a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and there were probably some termites in there as well. Verse number nine. And now the cry, this is God speaking. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way that the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now Moses, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so Moses is having this encounter with God. Moses sees something a little bit different. Moses sees something a little bit strange. God is calling him by name, but it's all evidence that he's having an encounter encounter with God. And church, we can't deny that this was, this was an encounter that Moses was having with God. It was a powerful moment. And if you know the story, God begins to reveal to Moses, Moses, I'm calling you. I'm choosing you to go back to Egypt and to bring my people, the Israelites, out of the bondage and out of the slavery that they have been in. And if you know the story at all, and if, if, even if you don't, let me just recap it briefly for you. Moses begins to argue with God. Moses begins to tell God, God, do you know who you're talking to? I can't do that. I don't speak that well. I wouldn't even know what to say. You want me to go confront Pharaoh who was the king of Egypt? And you want, who am I? I'm a nobody. I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to talk. And Moses starts arguing with God, giving him all the excuses as to why he can't do what God was calling him to do. But ultimately God says, Moses, there are no excuses because if I'm calling you, then I will be with you and I will empower you to do what I've called you to do. So reluctantly and hesitantly, ultimately, Moses 
finally decides to obey God. He doesn't feel very confident about it. He's a little bit reluctant about it, but he finally makes a decision to obey God. So Moses now gets his family, his wife, his kids, and he starts making preparations to obey what God told him to do. To go to Egypt because God told him that I'm gonna, I need you to confront Pharaoh and then you're going to bring my people up out of the bondage that they're in. I want you to pick it up now at verse number 18 of chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 18. Moses is now preparing himself to go and obey what God has told him to do what he heard in this encounter with the Lord. Verse 18 of chapter 4. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, go, and I wish you well. He's going to go obey what God told him in that encounter. Verse 19. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons and put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt, and he took the staff of God in his hand. 21. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. Now look at this little detail right here, because it says if God says, Moses, I I, I told you in that encounter how I was going to use your life. Moses, I gave you a promise in that encounter. I gave you an an assignment in that encounter. You're to go and talk to Pharaoh and you're to bring my people out of the bondage that they have been in. Oh, but Moses, did I forget to tell you this little detail? And Moses has already saddled his donkey and he's already on the way. And God says, hey, but wait, Moses, I need you to understand this little detail. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. In other words, here's what God says. Moses, I know I told you that, that, that you're going to go and speak to Pharaoh, and I know I told you that you're going to go and you're going to lead my people out of bondage, but here's also what I need you to know. Even though you're obeying me, and even though you're following through with what I told you in my encounter, expect resistance in your life. You're going to be resisted. You're going to experience resistance. Don't just think because I spoke to you. Don't just think because you had a real encounter with me that it's just going to be easy from here on out. No, you're going to experience resistance, Moses. But I need you to know that in spite of the resistance that you experience, I need you to do what I told you to do. And I need you to believe what I told you I was going to do. Don't doubt it. And don't change the assignment just because you experience resistance. Church, listen to me. If you have been in an encounter with the Lord, God spoke to you. God gave you a promise. God is moving in your life. God is doing powerful things in your life. But you and I can expect resistance along the way. Even after an encounter with God, we can expect resistance. But you and I need to understand, just because there's resistance after an encounter does not mean that God has changed his mind. What he said, he will be faithful to do it. And if he told me to do something, even if there's resistance, I need to do it anyways. I need to do it anyways. Why is resistance important? Church, listen to me. The resistance is not there to kill us. The resistance is not there to cancel the promise that God gave to our lives. The resistance doesn't come to our lives so that then we can say, see, then what I heard in the encounter wasn't God at all. See, what I felt in that encounter wasn't God at all. No, 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 listen to me. Church, do you understand that there are people that every year spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to have a membership at a gym where they go to have resistance in their lives? They spend, some of you spent, I don't do this. You can probably tell. But there are people that pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars every year to go to a place so that you can sweat because you are pushing against resistance. Why do you do that? Why do you pay for it? Because you understand that the resistance isn't there to kill you. But what the resistance actually does is it builds you and it strengthens you and it makes you stronger. So as Moses was going to obey God from the command that he received in the encounter, God says, Moses, I need you to understand that you're going to still experience resistance along the way. But don't you dare think for a moment that I'm not with you. And don't you dare think for a moment that I've changed the assignment. And don't you dare think for a moment that it wasn't me who spoke to you. Just 
just because there's resistance, it still means that I'm going to use you. And as a matter of fact, because of the resistance, it's going to mean that my miracles are going to be displayed in a more powerful way. That my power is going to be displayed in a more amazing way because of the resistance that you experience. So church, listen to me. What can you expect after you have a real and a powerful experience with God? Expect resistance. It's going to come. Your faith will be challenged. Your body might want to might wanna lie to you if you were healed. Your body might want to lie to you, and all of a sudden you're going to get that little ache again, and you're going to be tempted to think, uh-oh, it's back. It's not back. It's resistance for you to continue to believe and to trust that what God did was true. Resistance. Expect resistance. Let me, let, me, let me take you to another encounter that we find in the Bible. For this, I want you to go with me to the book of Mark, chapter 9. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 2. In Mark, chapter 9, we're going to begin to see the encounter that Peter, James, and John had with the Lord. Moses' encounter teaches us that we can experience resistance. We can expect resistance after an encounter. But what does Peter, James, and John teach us? Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse number 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. Jesus says, Peter, James, and John, come with me. I'm going to take you up on the mountain. I'm going to show you things you've never seen before. You're going to experience things that you've never experienced before. We're going to have an encounter. There he was, the Bible says, as they were up on that mountain, all alone. There Jesus was transfigured before them. What does that mean, that Jesus was transfigured? It means that when Peter, James, and John were looking at Jesus in one moment, they turned around, and by the next moment, they looked at Jesus again, and he was completely, in his appearance, transfigured, transformed. He didn't look like he looked just a moment ago. Watch what the Bible begins to describe. Verse number three. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. So Jesus is transfigured and transformed in such a way that now they are seeing him completely filled with the glory of God. He doesn't even look the same now. And not only that, but when it was just Jesus, Peter, James, and John, now all of a sudden Moses and Elijah are there and they're having a conversation with Jesus and Peter, James, and John are watching it all and they're hearing it all. Look what, his, what it says next. Verse five, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, you know what? It's good for us to be here. What an understatement, right? What a, what a kind of like a dumb thing to say. Lord, it's, 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 good, it's good that I'm here. It's a good thing that I'm here. It's a good thing you invited me to this party. Now watch what he says next. <clears throat> Let us put up, this is Peter speaking. Let us put up three shelters. In other words, three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Notice what Peter says. He says, Lord, it's good for, it's good for me to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this party, to this encounter. Here's what I want to do, Jesus. I want to set up three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Why do you think Peter wanted to set up some tents for them? Because he didn't want the moment and the encounter to end. He didn't want this experience to end. He wanted, he wanted to live in this moment of encounter with God. So Peter says, Lord, I don't want to leave this. Your presence is so amazing right now. Your glory is so amazing right now. What you're doing, this encounter is so powerful right now. Lord, let me, let me set up three tents. One for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. We'll just live up here, and I'll just sleep on the ground. It don't matter to me. I just want to be here. And, and, and notice that Jesus doesn't turn to Peter and say, you know what, Peter? That's an excellent idea. Set up those tents. Jesus doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, you know what Jesus actually tells Peter? Uh-uh, Peter, we're going to go back down to where the people are. Why is that, church? Listen to me. Because as much as we would want to stay in a moment of encounter with God, 
the encounters that God gives us are not for us to just set up a shelter and to live there and to never come back down to touch the people. We need to come down from the spiritual mountains that we have been, and those spiritual mountain experiences are amazing, aren't they? Those spiritual mountain experiences with God are powerful, aren't they? But church, listen to me. God doesn't give us those encounters just so that we can keep them to ourselves. He wants us to come down from the mountain, and he wants us to begin to touch people's lives with the power that we received while we were on the mountain. And so Jesus now begins to bring Peter, James, and John down from the mountain because you, you can't just live there. But I want you to pick it up now at Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And, I, and I'm going to ask our team to come, our worship team. And I want you to listen to what it says here. As they started to come down from that experience with God, the Bible says they came to the other disciples. They came down the mountain. They came down to where the people were. And they came to the other disciples. And they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. What do they come down to experience after their encounter with God? They come down to people arguing. Isn't it true, church, that sometimes after an amazing service, after an amazing and a powerful time in the presence of God, we get to the parking lot, and then all of a sudden, there's fights and arguments and discord. Or we'll go back home, and there's bickering, and there's fighting, and there's arguing. This is what happened after their encounter. Watch what it says. Around them, the teachers of the law were arguing with them. 15, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder, and they ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, Jesus asked. Verse 17, a man in the crowd answered, and I want you to hear this, church. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who was possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes at the teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Verse 19, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him to Jesus. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foamed at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or into the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Verse 23, if you can. It's as if Jesus said, boy, don't you know who you're talking about? What you mean, if I can? If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. 24. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, but the spirit came out. The boy looked so much like a dead corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up to his feet, and he stood up. And when that guy stood up, church, he was free, he was delivered, he was healed by the power of God. Okay? But I want you to notice what those disciples, Peter, James, and John, experienced when they came back from that encounter with God. Here's what it's called. They experienced spiritual warfare. They experienced spiritual warfare. They come back from a powerful encounter with God, but what do they find? A spirit that is in operation, trying to work and to undo what God had revealed to them and what God had done while they were in an encounter with him. They encountered spiritual warfare. Church, listen to me. What can you and I expect whenever God is moving and working in our lives? What can you and I expect whenever God starts to do something powerful in our lives? We better expect spiritual warfare. Why is that? Because the Bible still says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to destroy what God is doing in your life. He wants to rob you, to steal the blessings that God has given you. He wants to take the word of hope and promise that God gave to you and you engage in spiritual warfare. Now, the disciples were not able to cast out that spirit. Jesus gets frustrated with them, and he says, bring the boy to me. 
And Jesus teaches the disciples that even though you're engaged in spiritual warfare, those spirits are not intended to overcome and overwhelm you, but you have the power and the authority to overcome them when you battle in spiritual warfare. <clears throat> but how do you do that? How, how do you win these spiritual battles that we're facing even after we've come off of a powerful encounter with God? Because those spiritual battles are going to happen. How do you win? How do you, how do you maintain? How do you retain the blessing that God gave you? How do you allow for the, for the fire to keep burning and not die out, not fizzle out? How do you ensure that what God's doing in your life right now doesn't just become a fad that's here today and gone tomorrow? Listen to what Jesus said in verse 28. The Bible says that after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Lord, why couldn't we drive it out? In other words, they said, Lord, how come, how come we couldn't overcome in this spiritual battle that we were in? How come, how come those spirits overcame us instead of us overcoming them? How come we couldn't drive it out? Now listen to what Jesus says in verse 29. He replied, it's because this kind comes out only by prayer. Now, now I know when you see that and when you read that, you're like, well, yeah, prayer. Like, we're supposed to pray. No, you don't understand. Listen to what Jesus actually said and what he actually meant. The word that is used there for prayer is the word prosyuke. Prosyuke. The Greek language, it's the word prosyuke. But I want you to listen to the, to the specific definition of it. The specific definition of that word that is used right there in this verse. That this kind only comes out by prayer. In other words, that the way you overcome in spiritual warfare is by prayer. The word prosyuke actually means a place set apart or suited for offering prayer to God. In other words, this is what Jesus actually told them, and they would have understood it in their language. He said, it's because this kind, this type of victory you will experience only when you have a place of prayer in your life where you are meeting with God consistently on a daily basis. Church, the way that you ensure that what God is doing in your life right now is not just a fade that is here today and God gone tomorrow. The way that you ensure that the fire that you receive from God that is burning in your heart doesn't die out and fizzle out. The way that you retain what God spoke to you. The way that you continue to allow what God is doing in your life to spread to your family, to your loved ones, to your children, to your co-workers. The way that it happens is you and I got to leave from that encounter and we got to go back to our houses and we got to build a place of prayer in our lives. Build a place of prayer in our homes. And y'all, I, I mean this spiritually, but I also mean it literally. Some of us need to leave this service today, and we need to go empty out an old closet in our house where there's a bunch of mugrero there, where there's a bunch of junk there. Take it to the goodwill, throw it in a dumpster, but make that a place of prayer in your house. Because when you have a place of prayer in your house, you will no longer live from event to event, from Bible study to Bible study, from revival service to revival service, from conference to conference. You will be a walking, living revival service yourself because you have a place of prayer every day of your life. Church, we are the revival that God is bringing upon this world. Yes, we have designated days. Yes, we have designated times. And yes, we acknowledge when God is moving among us. But we take those experiences and then we say, Lord, I'm building a place of prayer in my home. And I'm building a place of prayer in my life. Because what, what I received in the experience now becomes who I am every single day of my life. I'm a walking revival. You are a walking revival. Spreading the fire of God wherever you go. But it requires that you build a place of prayer in your home. Stand with me. So church, listen, listen, practical, practical. Some of us need to go to our house. And I know I said that. You might have thought I'm playing. No, we need to empty out a closet. And, a lot, and, and I know there's a bunch of Hispanic people here. I'm Hispanic, so I can say this. It's not, it's not offensive. I'm Hispanic. I can say it. Every Hispanic home has a cuartito. A cuartito is a little room where you know that you got nothing but junk in there. It's stuff from 1950, que tanto. 
You're never going to use it anymore. It's got a bunch of clothes that you're never going to fit in anymore. Throw them out. And make that a place of prayer in your home. Kick out the dog from the pantry if you have to and make that an altar in your home. Some of you, some of you need to go to, to, to Walmart or Sam's or to a bookstore or on Amazon and you need to buy yourself a new Bible. A Bible that you can understand when you read it. Not just a Bible that you read it and you don't understand it because you think that that's the, Bible, the only version of the Bible that God speaks through. No, get that out of your head. Get a Bible that is true to the Word of God, but that you can understand it because you say, Lord, this is where I'm going to be with you every single day of my life from this day forth. It's going to become a place of prayer for me. Some of y'all need to go buy a journal because God's going to speak to you and you need to write down. Listen, I give you permission to go buy Bibles, journals, pens, highlighters, whatever you need. Go all out. Go all out. But use them not for your favorite love novels. Use it as you meet with God consistently on a daily basis. And when you create a place of prayer in your life and in your home, watch what God will begin to do as the fire grows and spreads in your life. Come on, if this is your heart's desire, can we end today? Can we end today? If you would like coming to the altar and just beginning to say, Lord, set a fire. Set a fire down in my soul. Set a fire down. Come on, before we leave today, can we just make this our prayer? Can we make this our cry before the presence of God? I want more of you, Lord. I want more of you. I want more of your presence, God. Come on, your prayer, your cry. That I can't contain. Let it spread. Let it grow, God. Oh, come on, church. This has got to be the cry of our heart. This has got to be the prayer of our lives. The prayer of our lives. The cry of our hearts. I want more. I want more. I want more of you, God. I don't want this to just be a fad. I don't want it to just fizzle out, God. I want it to grow. I want it to spread. I want you to use me. I need you. I want you. I hunger for you. I desire you, God. Do something new in my life, Lord. Do a new work in me. More of you, God, in my life. More of you, God, in my heart. Come on, church. More. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, more men.
kindness, more loyalty, more commitment, God. We want more. We want more, Jesus. We need more of your power. More of your power, more of your strength, Lord. So that no matter the resistance that we experience, we're going to do it anyways. We're going to believe you anyways. a fire. Give us a fire that does not run out. Give us a fire that does not fade out, God. Fire, Lord. More of you, Jesus. More of you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for every home that is represented here today, God. I pray that that home would be a home in revival, God. I pray for every family that is here today, Father. And I pray that we would be families that are experiencing the fire of revival in our families, God. I pray for our children, Lord. There might be people here today, God, that their children are bound, Lord, by alcohol or pornography or drugs or homosexuality. Father, break the chains in Jesus' name. Break the chains of addiction. Break the chains of bondage in our families, in our children, God. We want more of you, God, in our homes. We want more of you in our children's lives. We want more of you in our families, God. God. We want more of you, Father. Use us to spread this fire. Use us to spread revival, Lord, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, God, in our family gatherings, Lord. Use us, Jesus. Let this fire grow. Let this fire increase. Let this fire spread. I was sharing before we left in, our, in the previous service, church, that one of our church fathers, and when I say church fathers, I don't mean someone from this church. I mean within the church of Jesus Christ, Christianity. One of the early believers, one of the early Christians. Someone came up to them and, and asked them, how is it that God has used your life so powerfully? How is it that so many people have come to know Christ through you? Because this was somebody that God used in powerful ways and that God used to bring many others into his kingdom. And this church father of all of ours, of Christianity, was asked, how have you done that? How has God used you in this way? And his response was so profound. Here's what he said. He says, I've allowed God to set my life on fire. And when I've been burning, people have come from everywhere just to come and see me burn. I allowed God to set my life on fire. And when I allowed God to set me on fire, people just came to watch me burn. But as they came to watch me burn, in other words, as they came to see God in my life through my everyday actions, through my everyday lifestyle, as people came to watch me burn, eventually there was moments where they came and they asked me, what's the secret? How do you do it? How do you always have joy in spite of the resistance that you're facing? How is it that you have victory even though there's spiritual battles that are taking place in your life? How is it that you always have this joy? How is it that you always have this sense of peace no matter what's happening in your life? And he says, and whenever they came to watch me burn and they asked me those questions, my answer was always, it's Jesus in my life. He's the secret. It's just God. So church, let the Lord set a fire down in your heart, in your soul. But you and I have the responsibility to make sure that it doesn't fizzle out, that it doesn't burn out, but that that fire keeps growing and spreading. And here's what's going to happen. In your life, people are going to come to watch you burn. And when they come, you're going to have opportunities to tell them, the secret in me is Jesus. The secret to my joy is Jesus. The secret to my peace is Jesus. The secret to my victory is Jesus. They're going to come to watch you burn, but it'll be an opportunity to show them that the answer has always been and will always be Jesus.
Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We acknowledge that you have been moving in us. We acknowledge that you have been at work in us. But Lord, now we have a responsibility to go to our homes and to build a place of prayer that daily, that consistently we would meet with you. We would spend time with you so that the fire that you've started in us will not die down but on the contrary it'll grow and it'll spread and may people come to watch us burn and when they do may we be quick to open our mouths to say the answer is Jesus the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Church, we're blessed. So let's go be a blessing in his name and for his glory. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place.